Yeah, I stopped off at a diner on the way in to get a cup of coffee, and it was pretty bad. And I said, this coffee tastes like mud. And the waitress said, well, it was fresh ground this morning. <laughs> get it? Fresh ground. <laughs> a little slow, but we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is good to see everybody. <coughs> Sorry I'm sounding a little hoarse. But, uh, yeah, I got here, and, and there was hardly anybody here, and I said, well, I guess they heard I was coming, but <laughs> i got a few more people now, so that's good. And uh, I'm speaking first. I told Neil I needed to go as soon as I get done because there's a lady I know in the community back in Tuscaloosa who's turning 100, and she's having a little party today, so I'm gonna, thought I ought to go to that. You don't turn 100 very often, so. But um, anyway, it's good to be here, good to see everyone. And what I wanna talk about today, and if you want a title for the message, it is Lessons from the Story of Naaman. Lessons from the story of Naaman. I think probably we're all at least vaguely familiar with the story of Naaman in the Bible. But I think there might be some lessons we can learn from it. So let's take a look at it today. And let's start in 2 Kings chapter 5. And verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was also a leper. Naaman was a commander of the armies for Ben-Hadad, who was the king of Aram, which is today what we refer to as Syria. And the relations between Israel and Syria had been off and on again over the years. And for a time, Ahab, the king of Israel, had an alliance uh, with Ben-Hadad, particularly in regard to the Assyrians, who had been troubling both nations. Now, for a little historical note, in 1 Kings 19, 15 through 18, you don't have to turn there, but uh, we see that God told Elijah to go and anoint Hazael to be the next king after Aram, to anoint Elisha to be his successor as prophet, and then told of events that would come. Hazael didn't take over as king, and these events didn't happen until 2 Kings 10, so Naaman was serving King Ben-Hadad, and we don't know how much time had elapsed. Elisha was still serving as prophet, but nothing else referred to in that passage had taken place yet. So. At any rate, there was at least some knowledge and interaction between the two nations, but that relationship was kind of tenuous at best. So we begin the story by being introduced to Naaman, commander of the Syrian army, who was a great man. It says he's highly regarded by the king, and it's unproven, but some people believe Naaman was the man who shot the arrow that killed King Ahab of Israel in 1 Kings 22. I don't know. But it was through Naaman, it says, that the Lord gave victory to Aram. So maybe he did kill Ahab, maybe he didn't. But there's no doubt how powerful and how influential Naaman was. But Naaman had a problem. As it says at the end of verse 1, while he was a brave warrior and a mighty man, he also had leprosy. Some sources I read indicate that there were different levels, milder forms of leprosy that you could still have and fulfill your responsibilities, so maybe he had that, but even if that was true, it was still a serious thing to have and something you didn't want. Verse 2, the Syrians had gone out by companies and brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. There were bands of soldiers, marauders, if you will, who would go and invade Israelite villages and pillage them. And on one such raid, they brought back a young Israelite girl who served Naaman's wife. Oh, I can hear me now. And working in the household, 
She knew of Naaman's problem and no doubt knew that he was searching for a solution. Verse 3, so she said to her mistress, would God that my Lord were with the prophet that's in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Samaria was the capital of Israel at this time. And this Israelite girl knew there was a prophet in Israel who could help Naaman. And so off Naaman goes. Verses 4 through 7. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus says the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he went, he took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come to you, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God? to kill and to make alive, that this man sends to me to heal this man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeks a quarrel against me. So Naaman goes to make a state visit, and he brings a lot of stuff, as was common when you were going to, to visit a leader. He brought gold and silver and fine garments, and he goes to the king of Israel. But the king knows he doesn't have the power to heal, and he can't imagine why Naaman came to him, except he was thinking that this is Ben-Hadad's way of picking a fight. If you can't heal him, then we will come and deal with you. So the king rends his clothing as the custom was because he's afraid of what may happen, but he does nothing to help Naaman. And so Elisha gets wind of what's going on, verses 8 and 9. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel rent his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why did you rent your clothes? Send him to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Elisha finds out what's going on, sends a message to the king, essentially rebuking him, saying, What are you doing? Just send him to me, and I'll take care of him. And then he'll know that God is working and there's a prophet in Israel. So the king sends him. Naaman arrives at Elijah's house. Verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and chariot and stood at the door. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will come again to you, and you'll be clean. But Nathan was angry, and he went away and said, Behold, I thought, surely he'll come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord God and strike his hand over the place and heal my leprosy. Are not Abana and Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. So this important man, as he thinks he is, Elisha goes to Elisha's door, and Elisha doesn't even come out to see him. He just sends him a message telling him what to do. Go dip in the Jordan seven times, and you'll be okay. So Naaman goes away. You, you've heard that old saying, don't go away mad, just go away. <laughs> Naaman went away mad. You can just imagine him saying, I am this great, mighty man of war, commander of all the armies of Syria. He doesn't even come out and meet me, and all he does is tell me to go and dip myself in the nasty waters of the Jordan River. We've got better rivers than that at home. Why doesn't he at least come out and wave his hand over the spot and do some ritual like the priests back home would do? And that is what the pagan priests would have done. And Naaman may well have had that experience, but it didn't work. So that's why he came to see the prophet of the Lord. Verse 13. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? How much rather than when he says to you, wash and be clean? So then he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again, 
like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. One of the servants heard all this and saw what was happening, and he said, look, if he had given you some big thing to do, you'd have done it, wouldn't you? So why not just go do what he said and see what happens? What have you got to lose? And so Naaman thought, well, okay. He listened, did as Elisha said, and he was healed. Verse 15. So he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray you take a blessing from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before who I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So the healed and grateful Naaman now goes back and he tries to give Elisha all this stuff he brought, the gold, the silver, the clothing, but Elisha refused. Verse 17, Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray you, be given to your servant two mules' burden of earth? For your servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. In this thing, the Lord pardon my servant, that when my master goes into the house of Rimmon to worship there and leans on my hand and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon your servant in this thing. And so he said to him, go in peace. And so he departed from him a little way. So Naaman now realizes there's only one God, and it's him that he will serve from here on out. And so he takes two mule loads of dirt so he can construct some kind of altar on which he can worship the true God. Now, let's take a moment and see what lessons we can begin to learn from the story of Naaman so far. Lesson number one. Every one of us needs God's healing, just like Naaman. Every one of us needs healing of some kind, just like Naaman. It doesn't matter how mighty and how powerful you are. No matter how successful you may be or how good things may look from the outside, until we come to God, all of us are like lepers. We are people with no hope. Naaman was not an ordinary guy off the street in Syria. He was great in their society. He was powerful. He had honors and wealth heaped upon him. And yet he was still essentially hopeless. Leprosy in that day, even if it was mild, basically meant you were doomed. There was no cure and it wasn't going to get any better. So the only hope this mighty man had was to humble himself before God, approach him with an open heart, and a willingness to listen to what he had to say. And only then could he be healed. It really isn't much different with any of us. Leprosy is a type of sin in our lives, and sin is a disease that is incurable until or unless we come to the point like Naaman did, that we realize we're living under a death sentence. And the only solution is to come to God for healing and for the cure. Dipping in the Jordan, I think, may be symbolic of baptism, which depicts our death and resurrection, the death of our self-will and the resurrection of the new man or woman, cleansed of our sin, the death sentence removed, and beginning a new life. Well, in any case, just as he did with Naaman, God cleansed most of us, and if he hasn't yet, he can, he takes us, cleanses us, and makes us new. But each one of us has to have that experience. Each one of us has to have that experience of healing and cleansing. Lesson number two. Small acts of faith and obedience can accomplish great things. Small acts of faith and obedience can accomplish great things. The first act of faith in this story was what? It was the Israelite servant girl. She knew that if Naaman had any hope of healing, he would have to go see the prophet of God. And so even though she was captive in a pagan land, she retained her faith and in doing so influenced Naaman 
who came to believe. Who would have thought that it would be the words of a young enslaved girl that would lead to the events that would cause the second most powerful man in all of Syria to learn who the true God is? You don't know how you might influence other people as well. Maybe just with a word. You know, people know it as things about us. Not everybody does, but there are people who may not see the things we do in terms of our observances, the Sabbath, the holy days, and that. But they may sense something different about us. And that may give us an opportunity to influence them at some point. We don't know. All we know is that we have to live the lives God called us to live wherever we are and whatever we're going through in order for that to happen. Now, the second act of faith is Naaman's obedience to what Elisha told him to do. Dipping in the Jordan seven times didn't really seem like an appropriate thing to Naaman. He expected more, something more grand and appropriate for a mighty man like he was, not just dipping in the dirty Jordan River. And because it seemed like a small, trifling, and maybe even a degrading thing, he almost didn't do it. But he did. Thanks to one of his servants, he chose to go ahead. And God healed him just as Elisha told him he would. So what about us? If we pray for something, do we expect God to answer it in some big dramatic fashion? Maybe even calling on him to do some big grand thing. But God doesn't always work that way. Do we then follow in simple humble obedience, even if he tells us to do something that seems as menial as dipping in the Jordan did to name it. God doesn't work the way people think he should. God works in ways that are counterintuitive to man. God loves to take that which is small and make something great out of it. It's what he's doing with us. You know, it applies to things as well as people. Luke 17, 6 tells the story of the mustard seed. You know it. If you've ever seen a mustard seed, you know how small it is. And yet, Jesus says, if you have an amount of faith that small, it can accomplish amazing things. 1 Samuel 15, verse 17, again, you don't have to turn there, but it talks about Saul and when he was made king over Israel. And at that time, he was a humble modest man but over time he became more puffed up more self-important and more disobedient to God and he's reminded in this verse 15 17 first Samuel that when he was small in his own sight God made him king and planned to do great things through him but he lost that smallness that humility became elevated in his own sight God didn't want anything to do with that. God loves to take that which is small to accomplish his purposes. People tend to like big things. I do. You know, that's the way people determine who's successful and who isn't in this world. <clears throat> that applies to all kinds of things, including churches. Take a look at our little fellowships. You know, this one, ours, down in Pelham. They're small. And we're basically a humble little group or groups. But, you know, as long as we do what God gives us to do, we are a success in his sight, whether we think so or not. You know, if because we're not big doesn't mean we're not successful. As long as we're doing what God gives us to do and doing what he gives us to do is far more important than looking big or important in the sight of men. I had somebody a while back say to me that it would be nice to have a Sabbatarian megachurch. And I thought, boy, that'd be great. You know, have thousands of people coming on the Sabbath in one place to worship. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yeah, maybe that's not a good idea. You know, I, I'd love to see everybody understand and join us, but so often, we hear these stories about where megachurches exist, other problems arise as well. 
there have been a couple of big names in the news just recently in the last couple of weeks, pastors of megachurches who had to resign because of various things they had done at some point. There is, I won't mention the denominational name, but I've got a friend by affiliation who was a part of that big denominational church in Arkansas, Little Rock. It's coming apart because there were two or three people on the staff who got involved in things they shouldn't, and the pastor covered it up, and so the church is in deep trouble. Mega churches are not all they seem like they, they are. You know, and there have been pastors of mega churches who've gotten in trouble because they let the fame and the money or maybe the pressure get to them. If God chooses to give us growth in terms of numbers, that's great. And when he does, that'll happen. But we don't need to think that God doesn't love us or that we have a problem because we're not growing in terms of numbers and seeing a lot of new people because that is not the measure of success in God's sight. Zechariah 4. Verse 10. For who has despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel, with those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. The people had been discouraged. They had a huge task in front of them, and things were going slowly, and it seemed as though they should have been able to accomplish a lot more. And what does God say? He says, who has despised the day of small things? He says, don't worry that you're not doing big things. This is the day of small things. And it may be a day of small things for the church of God. We can't let that discourage us. Small acts of faith, small acts of obedience can accomplish great things when God is in them. Lesson number three. God takes us, when we come to him, God takes us from where we are. God takes us from where we are. Sometimes I think we expect people to come in, make an immediate change, and, and sometimes it's harder to do that for various reasons than we might give people credit for. Notice what Naaman said to Elisha. He said it was part of his job to accompany the king into a pagan temple where the king would be worshiping Rimen. And Rimen was actually a city where there was a temp temple dedicated to Baal. And so he was going into that temple with the king. Naaman was expected to accompany the king, take him into the temple, and bow down there. But he asked Elisha to ask the Lord to pardon him. And what did Elisha say? He said, go in peace. He didn't say, you can never go into that temple again, and you're probably going to have to quit commanding the Syrian forces and whatever else he might have said. When he said, go in peace, that was an indication that God would at least initially not hold it to his account. In the King James, it makes a reference to the king leaning on Naaman. It's very possible that the king may have been old, aged, and required Naaman's assistance. So we have to consider that Naaman is a brand new convert going back into a pagan land and we have to consider the intent of his heart. If he maintained his exclusive faithfulness to worshiping the true God and he was only there to be of assistance to the king, evidently God allowed it at least for a time. If he hadn't, well, Elisha clearly would have told him to stop. But as he did, or does with us, God took Naaman from where he was. We all have to grow at our own pace. We don't know anything else about Naaman or what happened. But if he remained faithful, God surely would work with him and bring him to where he needed to be. None of us started out where we are now. And we still have a ways to go, all of us. You know, we all have things to learn. 
Such was the case with Naaman. Lesson number four. When you serve God, you can't let greed or dishonesty creep into your heart or life. Let's go back to 2 Kings. Back in verse 19, we'll read a little bit. So Elisha told him to go in peace, and so he departed from him a little way. But in verse 20, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master spared Naaman this Syrian in not receiving at his hands what he brought. But as the Lord lives, I'll run after him, and I'll get some of that. I'll take some what from him. So Gehazi follows after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after, he got off his chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? Is everything okay? And he said, All is well. My master sent me, saying, Behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray you, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. And Naaman said, be content, take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags, two changes of garments, laid upon two of his servants, and they took them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house, and he let the man go, and they departed. But he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said, where have you been? And he said, well, your servant went nowhere. <laughs> and he said, yeah, you did. Went not my heart with you when, man, when the man turned again from his chariot to meet you? Is this a time to receive money and garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and servants? The leprosy, therefore, of Naaman shall cleave to you and unto your seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. <clears throat> Gehazi had been Elisha's servant for a while, but when he saw the riches that Elisha turned away, he thought, I could make good use of some of that. So he convinced himself it was the right thing to do. So he takes off, and when he says, as the Lord lives, he is about to justify what he's about to do in God's name, as we can sometimes do. But God wasn't in this. And so he went after Naaman, lied about what he wanted and why. And when he came back, he lied to Elisha about what he had done and where he had been. In Barnes' notes on the Old Testament, he says, is this a time, that is, is this a proper occasion to indulge greed when a Gentile was to be favorably impressed and made to feel that the faith of the Israelites was the only true religion was it not, on the contrary, an occasion for the exhibition of the greatest unselfishness so a pagan might be one to the truth? And yet Gehazi didn't. God's healing is without price. What God does in our lives is priceless. For Gehazi to seek to profit from the healing of this Gentile was not God's purpose. He was guilty of greed and dishonesty, and as a result, he and his family had to suffer with the same ailment Naaman had been healed of. He paid a heavy price, and so we should learn his lesson. So, those are the lessons I glean, at least, from the healing of Naaman. And I think the Bible stories, we sometimes can read over them, but I think they're there not just to entertain us or to fill the Bible. I think there's something to learn from all of them. I've had a lot of occasions when I've learned from the examples of others, both in the Bible and in person, both good and bad. And it's always better if you don't have to learn the hard way. I, I remember telling my dad once, he said, I'm trying to keep you from making the mistakes I did or whatever. And I said, I want to make my own mistakes. <laughs> and he said, no, you don't. <laughs> and he was right. You know, The more mindful we are, of learning from the experiences of others, the fewer mistakes we'll make and the fewer consequences we will suffer. So let's take advantage of the lessons we can learn 
from the individuals in the Bible, realizing maybe there's more to the story than what we see on the surface. Anytime you read a story in the Bible, take a little time to analyze it and see what you can learn, and I think we'll all be better off if we do that.